let's move on the panel discussion for now. So allow me to introduce uh, the panelists from the left side. Professor David Sandro, inaugurated fellow of Columbia University, uh, ICF steering committee member, and he lead the ICF roadmap projects for three years. And second, uh, Dr. Kaoharo. And third, uh, Professor Dr. Geolo Eitman, uh, Professor Berlin University of Technology. Uh, he's also a member of the ICF steering committee. And fourth, Professor Kazuhiko Hongu, between Professor, Graduate School of Public Policy, the University of Tokyo, and a board member of CTC. And fifth, Dr. Dolph Gillen, Director of Irina Innovation and Technology Center. And sixth last, uh, Mr. Tony Fallop, a uh, Plum Director, Sustainable Energy Transformation and Microbrid Initiative, Monash University. So I do ask uh, Professor Sandro to moderate the discussion, if you please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. How's that? Good. Thank you. Uh, special thank you to our hosts from NITO and METI uh, for convening the ICEF conference. And congratulations on the great success that ICEF has achieved. As I said, it's been my privilege to serve as a member of the International Steering Committee for the ICEF conference. And I am so impressed by what Ivan Sarabe has done to bring together leaders from around the world to focus attention on this critical issue of innovation in particular. Uh, and we're not going to achieve our climate goals without innovation. It's absolutely essential. That's what we're going to talk about today. And we have an extraordinarily distinguished panel to do that. And, and so I thought I would just start with a, with a very general question because, um, on, on innovation. Today, um, we see uh, almost 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted every year. And around the world, we have people who are um, growing wealthier, who aspire to a middle-class lifestyle that, in many countries in the world, uh, typically involves more carbon dioxide emissions. So the pressures towards increasing carbon dioxide emissions only continue to grow. But here we're talking about net zero. Uh, we're talking about not increasing, but radically decreasing emissions of carbon dioxide by mid-century to the point that they're at zero. So, that's going to require a lot of change. Um, and, and I thought maybe I would just start um, with Georg, uh, and then we could just go down the row, um, then come back to Ayamenta, and ask, how, how are we going to do this? What, what will it require? What, how can we think about uh, the possibility of getting to net zero emissions? And, and, and I think we'll have a number of ideas, and then let's drill down on some specific thoughts about how we can do this. So Georg, how can we get to net zero? Yeah, of course, it is a long way. But, uh, but the first step is, I think, to my view, what, uh, what also the German government uh, states always when they are discussing this question, industrial countries which have a rich population should take the lead. They should show that it is possible to be a rich country and to have a low emission uh, level. Of course, actually, we have not the low emission, uh, emission not a sufficiently low emission, but we must lead trend towards reducing emissions. And of course, how to do it, that is of course difficult. In each country the problems are a little bit different. And, and what is needed for, for this, to my view, first is that the government need a stable environment in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. You should not uh, change, you should, the, the industry will not be successful in making innovations if they have to change their strategies every two or three years because the government changed its politics. We need a, a stable strategy. Uh, for example, one example is of course the, the European emission cap and trade system. To my view, it is a system which seems to work because uh, the European Union is was able or probably will be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in 2020 by 20% compared to 1990. When this target was formulated in 2005, it seems to be an extremely ambitious target. And now it seems we can reach it. So it is not so ambitious anymore. We can go more. And so therefore, actually, the 
European Commission is defining a target minus 40% reduction in 2030 compared to 1990. That means the same thing what happened in 30 years should be done in 10 consecutive years between 2020 and 2030. This shows that the government must set ambitious targets and then the industry will probably attend the academia, of course, I talk also for my profession, the research and development institutions, uh, will do their job. Of course, the second thing which is required that the government should try to incentivize the competition between the different solutions. It is not a good idea that the government says, we prefer nuclear industry, or we prefer solar energy, or we prefer this or that. Maybe this decision by the government turns out to be wrong, as we have seen in Germany with nuclear industry. The best thing is the government says, we set the targets, and we declare they are fixed, we should not go behind these targets, but we should then create an environment of competition between the different solutions. And the last point, of course, net zero means we will always have some positive emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from industrial processes. That means net zero will not possible without taking out CO2, greenhouse gases, out of the atmosphere. And here we have, of course, the most challenging part of our innovations. And this is, of course, carbon capture and use. This is what we showed this afternoon in the session of David, um, when he explains what is the state of the art. This is, of course, the, the, the ultimate requirement. All the rest, of course, making the system uh, moving from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuels, non-fossil, moving towards inefficient technologies to efficient technologies, etc. So this is quite obvious what we have to do with the next step. And uh, it seems that, that the ambitions uh, in Europe, minus 40% in, ten, uh, in, in 40 years, it means from minus 20% to minus 40% in 10 years. So if this will be reached, this is a sign that uh, industrial countries can achieve, can progress. We are not there yet. It will take more time. But uh, so this is the sign, yeah. Maybe I gave you another. That, that's great. And I just want to highlight one of the important points you made. There were so many there, Georg, but I know the experience in my country, the United States, validates what you just said about once we set a goal and work to hit it, it's often it, a goal is often achieved cheaper and faster than anyone predicted at, at the time. And that's in, in our roughly 50-year history of environmental regulation that's happened time and time again in the United States. Um, let me turn the microphone over to Professor Humboldt. Probably I can use it. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you very much, David. And uh, it's a great, great pleasure for me to sit together with four other excellent members and also David to discuss these innovation issues. Uh, I, I have a little bit different point of view that, 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 that the former uh, uh, mentioned. That our goal is decreasing 150 percent for the for the next 30, 40 years. Not the 10% or the 2%, 150% for reaching a one point degrees, which shows in the Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. But before that, I need, we need uh, uh, peaking out the global emissions under uh, Article 4.1 of the Paris Agreement. Even for that peaking out, we need innovation. And the outcome of the innovation is also important. And for the last five, last five years, I am um, the uh, I have been the board member of CDCN, and the biggest issue is how to match the outcome of innovation and finance. Matching the finance and technology is really important. Under the Paris Agreement, firstly, we, the member, all the member countries, agreed to matching the innovation and finance, technology and finance. And so I would like to ask uh, David. Uh, Secretariat to managing these financing issues, how to diffuse the innovation which will be uh, uh, created by all the specialists, all the engineers, all the industries uh, in, in the society. Uh, that is the key issues to, to the society, especially for poor countries, vulnerable countries, developing countries. Finance is a key because they need a present, present. Uh, the best available technology. If we can support that persons or countries picking up this following before reaching a 150% decrease in 
decrease of the present fear. That is my comment. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, certainly there's no way of doing this without mobilizing significant funds, and if, uh, uh, if the, the COP has agreed to mobilize $100 billion a year, the parties to the COP have agreed to that, um, that's one of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, Dolph um, from Arena, um, you know, he knows more than almost anyone I know about roadmaps, which we're going to be releasing, we're going to be releasing two of them um, uh, this afternoon. But, but I really urge you to go to Arena and see what they're doing in Roadmaps there. So it's, it's some superb work product they're doing there. Dolph, how are we going to get there? Thank you very much, David, for these kind of words. And um, thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, innovation is indeed uh, uh, very important to reach the uh, climate goals. In fact, on the occasion <coughs> of this COP, we have released um, a publication called Renewable Energy Innovation, Accelerating Research for a Low Carbon Future. Uh, if you are interested, ask me after the meeting of Francisco Bouchard, who is sitting in the back, who is the main author. Um, the, um, earlier this year we launched a report for the, for the G20 Presidency, together with the International Energy Agency on, on the uh, energy sector implications of the climate agreement. And our conclusion is we need uh, a decarbonization by 2050 and uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy account for 90%, 9-0, of what is needed. And uh, we're making good progress in the power sector, uh, but we see uh, a challenge really in the, in the energy sectors especially uh, the, the heavy industry and part of the transport sector. So the, the heavy duty trucks, aviation and shipping pose a very important uh, challenge and together these sectors account for about a third of global energy emissions. Now, um, and it's, it's not a lack of, of technology opportunities. There are very good engineers in these sectors they are very well aware of what can be done, but there, there is a problem in the, in the framework. So, for example, in industry, a problem that is always mentioned is there is competitiveness in carbon damage. And we've been talking about that now for 20 years. And you may recall 10 years ago we had sectoral approaches on the agenda. And it, it has kind of fallen off the table. And maybe we should think of putting it back on the table as a discussion. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not so much about technology in that sense. For the transport sector, well, I mean, the, only this morning we had a discussion very interesting about hydrogen and what's going on in hydrogen. And you may recall, again, 10 years ago, hydrogen was on the top of the agenda. It's kind of gone into obscurity, but it seems to be coming back. Every meeting now we're getting questions about hydrogen. So, Maybe hydrogen in combination with renewables can also play a role to solve some of the issues in the transport sector. So, interesting technology opportunities, but uh, uh, maybe the framework is, is really what, what uh, deserves most attention. Dolph, Dolph, can I ask you to follow up just on one of the important points you made about heavy industry? Because in the discussions that I'm in, this is one of the issues that gets very little attention in comparison to how much emissions come out of the heavy industry sector. Um, I, is that something that Arena is looking at, or, or do you have any thoughts on, on what we can do in the heavy industry sector? Well, we are looking at uh, what, what can you do with uh, renewables, either direct use of renewables, then we're mainly talking uh, biomass or solar thermal, or indirect use by using renewable electricity, or hydrogen to replace fossil fuels. And so th there are a lot of opportunities, but right now uh, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, an, an, you have to overcome that initial cost bump to get to scale to make it work. And you need to have a global to make it work. And the sectoral idea is very interesting. Oh, uh, Tony. Thank you very much. Um, just, uh, the same as everyone else, obviously, national, national targets are, are absolutely critical and uh, 
in Australia, we've especially seen that uh, where in a lack of a, of a national target, we've seen the subnationals come in and really drive innovation. I would like to say, as an ex-industry person, not necessarily from the university, I think there needs to be some responsibility taken by the private sector um, who don't see past the annual cycle of reporting. It's very hard to get innovative projects up in the private sector because of that short-term thinking. Now, what drives that? Is it, is it targets? Is it some type of um, financial driver? Well, but that is critical because at the end of the day, only the private sector can really drive innovation. It's government's role there to support it. Um, but just a little bit more specific around um, some of the stuff we're doing. Um, I think there's a bit of, of like complacency as well. I think everyone thinks that we've solved things like energy efficiency, that we don't need innovation in that space anymore. But it's actually really hard to do. I mean, at the we have committed to our two new buildings being net zero buildings. So that's a uh, German style passing us. Next to some renewables to get to a net zero building. Now that is extremely innovative and extremely difficult to do. And I think there's a, been a general theme to all the presentations that I've heard is we've solved that, let's move on. And I'm here to tell you we haven't solved that because we will not get uh, to net zero if we keep building buildings that aren't net zero. It doesn't matter what we do. Um, and the other thing that we do that, that I've been really fascinated about is this idea that it's one technology, it's, it's large scale renewables, it's, it's the demand side. And really, it's going to be doing those together. Uh, we especially see the power of, of the precincts and communities to be able to do that. Now, yes, there's, a, there's overused words like microgrids and smart grids, etc. But there's a real opportunity to innovate where we can collectively use those technologies and empower those communities, whether it be an islander community or whether it be something that's on the grid in you know, a first world country. We must drive innovation because collectively we can achieve a lot more in a precinct than we can by simply just building more and more wind like we did in Australia uh, until they got so politicised we actually backed out of that after we had a massive blackout in South Australia, which is quite famously so. Um, and those, those platforms, those platforms like a microgrid, are by themselves not the answer. I mean, they are not the magic cure. They are a platform to drive additional innovation, whether that be peer-to-peer -peer trading, blockchain, um, hydrogen buses, or all the different things we talk about. We need some way to bring that together. Because without that, we will never achieve that. Thank you. I say I'm so glad you started by talking about subnational targets because. In the United States, that's particularly important with our president who's buried his head in the sand and denied the reality of what we're talking about here. And and there's a great story about this for some of you might have heard this, but you know, when when Trump gave his speech saying the United States was gonna pull out of Paris, one of the things he said in his talk was, I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not the citizens of Paris. And it kind of sounded sounded good because both cities start with a P. Well, the mayor of Pittsburgh was listening and he said, what are you talking about? In Pittsburgh, we believe in climate change. In Pittsburgh, we believe that we can fight climate change and we can do it profitably. And so he got more media attention than he'd ever gotten in his life as a result of President Trump saying that. And, and, and here, in, here in Bonn, if you haven't seen it, we have the governor of California and we have Mayor Bloomberg of New York coming to say in the United States, we are still in. And we have hundreds of subnational units, including cities and states and companies that are telling the world we're still in no matter what our crazy president does. So, um, I'm glad you mentioned some national targets and gave me an excuse to say that. Um, uh, Amy, what I've enjoyed listening to these, these colleagues here. Uh, and I agree with what you said on, on targets. We need targets, we need uh, legal certainty and predictability. And uh, this is what I speak as, um, as for the lawmaker, legislation, legislator. Legislation should give targets but not intervene in term, terms of chosen means. And this is very important. We need targets that can be trusted. And I I, I have seen in Europe just frustrating things happening. Uh, sort of de manic depressive legislation going from one extreme to another. Uh, for instance, promoting first biofuels, then demonizing them, first promoting biomass, then demonizing it, and I could continue the list quite long. But the point is that this kind of bipolar legislation going from one extreme to another 
makes very difficult for any investor to, to dare to invest in Europe. And this has been a serious problem. Uh, so we need predictability, not just rushing back and forth with the latest fashion trends of, with, uh, of, of NGOs, which has very often been the case. And, uh, and then we need many things like sectoral approach was mentioned here. I'm, I'm very happy that it was mentioned. We need level playing field. Paris has created hopes that future climate policy will be more practical and will be composed of parallel elements. But the big question is whether the investors get a signal that they need. They, will they dare to invest in clean technology? In order to do that, they need to know that this kind of investment will be rewarded, not punished. And there we need level uh, playing field, a fair field. If we don't have uh, the same rules in trade and business, it's, it's clear that it happens easily that the polluter gets competition advantage, and this means worse re uh, results. Therefore, we also need honesty in observing our, our results. In, in Europe, I find it a bit problematic that during our climate measures, which have costed hundreds of billions of euros, we have actually increased our emissions if we take into account the imported goods, if we take into account the consumption, that the performance is not that, that fascinating. And it's so easy to boast with our achievements, but if we don't see that what has been happening a lot is outsourcing, outsourcing our emissions, but at the same time outsourcing our jobs. And I wouldn't call this climate politics. It may be uh, politics of, uh, of um, um, outsourcing the emissions of uh, production, but it's no kind of real accident. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to just start with a policy question and then maybe we can talk about technologies and, and I want to ask each of the panelists what technologies they're most excited about. But, but uh, several of you have mentioned a policy point. And I read it just did it and others have said, we really need consistency of policy. And I love your phrase, bipolar legislation. That like, sums it all up. But my question is, does anybody have any thoughts about how we achieve consistency of policy? Because in democracies, there's often a balance and a back and forth. And, and it's not just my country, but Australia has had a back and forth on policies. Canada has had back and forth on policies. Here in Germany, where we sit, the government said it was committed to fighting climate change, but then as a result of voter pressure, faces up low carbon energy and nuclear power. So how, um, does anyone have any thoughts about how we achieve that type of stability in policy that we all hope uh, for and think is important? I got on a similar theme to before. Um, I think we have got to the point of being quite skeptical that politicians will ever solve that problem. Because they will be reactionary to people's fears. And whether that's a fear of a blackout, fear of, of, of high energy costs, fear of any number of different things. And I think we do need to show that it can be achieved, that we can achieve, for example, a net zero town or a net zero precinct, or we actually need to show through demonstration because then people will start to believe, well, actually, that's not that hard, that's not that expensive, and, and the lights will stay on and focusing on the electricity sector as our highest emitter by far in Australia. And I, I've been doing this now for 20 years, and I've been waiting for the policy to, to stop changing every couple of years, and I, I really honestly don't think it will. And unless we have towns, communities, companies going forward and saying, we can do this, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough because it is expensive, but we will never, in our country, at least in Australia, we'll never get to that certainty unless someone takes a lead. And unfortunately, I still believe that it's, it's private sector, supported by government, uh, subnational, local councils, and universities, can demonstrate that this can be done. I won't actually change the policy in my life. I strongly believe that. That's a great point. Go on. <laughs> so maybe I don't know if you understand. Sector. And as you said, um, 
ultimately Thomas follows technology and economic reality. And that's the reason why innovation is so important, technology innovation. And I think the best example is solar in the world. 20 years ago, it is an expensive in technology. Now it's the largest investment, the largest capacity addition in power generation and continues to grow. So innovation can be really made. Yes. Uh, I'd like to say several things on this issue. So, first three, uh, the stability of national political system is really important and impossible. Um, while I was a leading uh, negotiator of the Japanese government, that was the timing of 2009, I clearly remember what happened in Copenhagen, the Japanese uh, political stability is not there. We, we change the prime minister every every half year, <laughs> but we see the same things in the other 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 uh, countries. But the uh, the knowledge and the expertise of the negotiators that makes this possible. Not the, the bottom up type and flexible and facilitated dialogue and NDC system. That this possible meant much with that real society. That is my first comment, and also. This is the timing for sectoral approach. Because in case of sectoral approach, uh, not only the government, but also the public and industry people are, are calmly sit uh, the round table and discussing what we can do for the future. That is more stable than in some case political system. That is the, the, the the outcome of our, our long, long negotiation from the to, uh, 1992 to uh, the past. And I would like to say one more uh, technology issues, uh, synthetic energy, inertia energy is really important. We need to penetrate or use a more and more renewable energy, mainly produced by photovoltaic and, and wind. But these two energy doesn't have inertia. That will make a big the link that you introduced what happened in the South Australia state. Huge blackout. So to prevent this type of huge blackout, if we would like to penetrate more and more renewable resources of energy, we need to soon develop a synthetic inertia technology to, 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 to produce a synthetic inertia to the grid. So this is a potential potential area of discussion under ICEP in, in, in the next fifth session, I believe. That's very interesting. Could you just say another word about what you mean by synthetic inertia of technologies? Uh, fossil or, uh, 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 I mean, the power generator, DC power generator uh, doesn't have uh, any energy. The, but uh, uh, the main fossil fuel uh, power generator gives an inertia, kind of inertia. You understand that the electricity engineering area is very famous. He knows very well than me. But uh, the wind is less the least inertia, and photovoltaic is, doesn't have any inertia. So when we drag, we would like to use the inertia for stabilizing a DC circulated grid. We need a, a, a kind of synthetic type of new new technologies for creating inertia by photovoltaic or wind. That is a very, very urgent uh, necessity for the, all of the society to try to use uh, uh, the local grid system. So this is a potential area for, for future, like, future discussion. And, uh, very good. I mean, a few of you have mentioned sectoral approaches. I wonder, are there good examples of sectoral approaches that have been most successful? Yes. I believe two uh, industry sectors, steel and cement. These are the good, good example. They are not discussing with the government, but in the worldwide uh, industrial society, they are, they are discussing how to penetrate more uh, Advanced technology in India or China.
Well, I, I could comment that from the uh, viewpoint of lawmaker. Uh, quite many times I was very much uh, connected with uh, European emissions trading. I was uh, in responsible of our, of our position on it, and I was uh, a shadow rapporteur or rapporteur in ATS a couple of times. And uh, at that time already I was very fascinated about this, this idea of uh, sectoral approach in, in, the, in combination of uh, emissions trading. It, it could be another kind of uh, approach. I could, uh, I could um, compare it with, think about emission, emission ceiling. We could also think about emission floor. With, with even better results, emission floor would mean that the best performer would would be rewarded, and this best performer, if 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 it is able to produce something uh, with lower emissions per produced ton, it sets a bench benchmark for anyone, and then it will uh, make the floor lower. So emissions would be reduced instead of uh, emission ceiling which actually is, is a politics of limitation to emission floor which doesn't set uh, any any targets for the best performers but the best performance will actually with their benchmark uh, set a new new goal and this kind of uh, system could be easily used in, in emission trading as easily as uh, emission the idea of emission ceiling, but I believe it would be with better, better results. Georg, you've studied these technologies in great depth. Are there any technologies that you're especially excited about that you think have great potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas zero? I should comment a little bit this top ten uh, talk on program of ISIS. Uh, what we learned from this program is that there is an abundance selection and variety of different ideas and, and the, the, the wealth of this activity select 10 out of hundreds of innovations is to observe how many different approaches are taken. The selection process uh, goes in three, so there, are, there are three main criteria. First of course there must be a contribution, the innovation should have a contribution to greenhouse gas and of course the greenhouse gas reduction potential must be there if this innovation will be implemented. The second uh, criterion is that there is an excellence of innovation. That means that it's really something new or that it's not a repetition of something that everybody knows already. And the third criterion is it should be feasible, it should be feasible, it should be implemented. And based on this criteria, uh, there is a process of several steps. The first uh, step is the secretary, the ISS secretary, uh, selects out of the literature 400 candidates, 400 uh, innovations. So it's a great number of, of innovations. In the end, we will have 10 uh, cases, 10, uh, 10 best cases. Uh, and the first step is this 400 is uh, goes to 100 by the secretary. Then uh, uh, a group in the steering committee of ISF selects out of these 125 uh, candidates from the top 10 innovations and then the delegates at the, at the ISF meeting select out of the 25 cases 10 cases. So that means there is of course much much more innovation which is studied by, by the ISF uh, team and by the delegates and by, by uh, the secretary, secretariat and, and at the end if we continue to do this process then we will see Innovation is not there is one silver bullet, renewables, photovoltaic, or, or carbon capture, or whatsoever. We will have probably a large variety of innovations in the combination at the end of the day. And the, the process of the top 10 innovations of the ISAF looks at there is many and how much is on the way. And of course, the idea is everybody, if you look what others are doing in the way, maybe you get ideas on what you can do. So, this is, I think, the of this potential which I'm happy to, to be participating in this process. Now I know um, I know we have expertise in the audience too, so I think if anyone from the audience wants to ask a question, please raise your hand and we can give you the microphone. Um, but while, while we wait on that, I want to ask any other panelists, are there, 
you know, we, it's about, about your favorite technologies um, or, or any technology you think is especially interesting. Tony, you've already talked about microgrids. Um, why don't you expand on that? What, what potential do you think they have? Um, I think the important thing about microgrids is it, it's not a magic cure. I, I say that again because it, it has become the buzzword of the last couple of years, like Internet of Things and blockchain, a lot of things like it. Um, where it's used a lot without really understanding what it means. It's an enabling technology, and, and that's what we see it. And if you look at that top 10 that you had up there, a lot of those can be done in isolation, but they get limits. So there's a little bit of how much uh, distributed solar you can put on a street before you start getting voltage problems below at a distribution point. There's a limit of large scale renewables. And that's what I used to do for a living, but I got out of that because I saw that eventually people would stop me doing that because it would become unsustainable on, on existing grids. And why I'm excited about microgreens is it's just a platform to help to help uh, bring the value of all those different technologies together, whether that's for the customer, whether that's for the local precinct, or even if it's selling services back into a fully electric grid as we move away from gas to, to all of electric, uh, electricity. I find a microgrid and smart grids to be that enabling technology that will enable everything else that's on that list, but without it, they all reach maximum type of penetration, and without that full penetration, 100%, um, then we can't get it. Oh, is that something you've looked at during the... Yes, we look a lot, a lot also at mini grids, and uh, we think that, that uh, they will play a very important role, especially where there is already a grid, you will you'll see mini grids that are integrated into, into centralized grids to enhance the resilience. To get, to get back to your, to your question, what is my favorite uh, technology? Um, we, we see hundreds of innovations. And we think that many of them will, will, will look very promising. But if you ask me which one will have most impact in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, I think that electric mobility, electric vehicles, in combination with renewable power, if it's done properly, a lot of caveats, can be very, very important and uh, have a really global impact. And what's your assessment of electric mobility? Is it, do you think it's going to grow a lot in the, in the, in the years ahead? Or is it a small thing that are passing fat, what do you think? Well, I mean, the, 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 the uh, market has grown 100% the last year, continues to grow. Uh, looking at uh, Germany, uh, last month, 2% of the sales were either uh, battery electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids. So, uh, you, you see that there, is, uh, that there is growth. There is a host of, of manufacturers that have announced, well, we're going to stop with uh, ICs, we're just going to do EVs. We're not going to say that uh, if, if that's the end of the company. So, uh, looks quite good. You agree, Professor? Yes, uh, may I add one more new technologies for, for which, which I would like to you to cover. Uh, that's a super critical geothermal power generation technologies. If we drill deep into the four to five thousand meters and reaching a near a magma field, if we inject the uh, uh, water, that water will change to super critical condition. That will make a huge potential of energy sources. Then also it has uh, inertia. So this is very uh, uh, new technologies. And in EU, uh, already EU supported the first expanded R&D activities in Iceland. Japan is now following. There are so many countries like India, Kenya, the US, or Italy, or Japan, or New Zealand. There are huge potential of geothermal energy sources. So this is the other area uh, for, for international cooperation and discussion under this uh, ICEF meeting. Thank you very much. That is a very interesting area. Do you think um, that has there been research done about the, about the seismic risk, the risk of earthquake associated with geothermal? That is the one risk. The other is how to retrieve uh, effectively. Uh, drilling, uh, drilling technologies already we have for, for exploiting gas or other, other uh, natural resources. So how to retrieve the, uh, the water deep 
from the deep, deep, deep ground, that is the technologies. We are soon uh, to reaching that outcomes within the next five, 10 or 20 years. Okay, Organo, I know you are, uh, you selected uh, many favorite technologies, but are there one or two that you'd like to talk about? I would uh, propose to distinguish between short-term, mid-term, and long-term technologies. Short-term are those technologies which really should, uh, should implement now in order to increase the share of renewable electricity. In this technology, I would uh, phrase flexibility options. Everything which, which makes the electric system more flexible on the demand side as well as on the supply side would help to increase the share of solar and wind. In the midterm, we need other type of or more technologies. Maybe it will be uh, this geothermal and, and other things. And what is clear in the long term, that means after 2040, we should have this carbon capture technologies ready. Otherwise, the, the, the promise of a net zero emission world will be hardly to achieve. My favorite technology uh, is a balanced combination of optimal energy solutions in their best and in their cleanest and most efficient form. Energy solutions are in the central role. Energy is not just another economic input. It is elementary, the missing factor of production for which there is no substitute. Because without exception, everything that humanity creates or does results from energy conversion. I would even maintain that climate policy is a subset of energy policy. To address climate, you must address energy first. And in that respect, I remain quite critical with subsidized wind and solar. This is a rather inconvenient truth. But all the investment in solar and wind over the last decade has yielded vanishingly little energy. A lot in terms of talk and even in, in terms of formal capacity, but in, in terms of produced energy, not so much. What has been the impact of all that new solar and wind on in, in reducing emissions? Um, I just read um, a new environmental progress report, which looked at 68 countries since 1965, and, uh, and uh, the results uh, where the addition of nuclear and hydro to electric grids is strongly correlated with a reduction in carbon intensity of energy. It means emissions per unit, uh, per unit of energy. Um, the addition of solar and wind is, is not that. And uh, I think we should still look at ROI figures and we should uh, avoid subsidies because they lock uh, energy systems in the infantry. Uh, the system should seek uh, the profitability from the market and not from subsidies. And that would really mean that, uh, that we can proceed with energy solutions. I personally, I, I <clears throat> hope to see nuclear renaissance uh, in spite of all difficulties. And I, I also think that thorium in the future is is an elementary part of nuclear story. Well, uh, thank you for adding some controversy to this discussion, I agree, to that. Uh, it makes it much better. I, I, so you were just very critical of renewables, and we have a uh, leader here from the International Renewable uh, Energy No, Agency. I'm not critical. Uh, I have to say I'm not at all critical for the new renewables. Okay. I just uh, want them to be effective, and too much subsidizing doesn't do that. That was that was my point. Dolph, do you have any thoughts uh, in response? Well, let me inject some facts into the discussion. The share of nuclear in global power generation has decreased from 18% about 20 years ago to 10%. The share of uh, solar and wind in global power generation has increased from virtually zero to 10%. So. These are quite opposite developments uh, regarding uh, the issue of, of uh, subsidies. I, mean, uh, I think you're from Finland. Uh, I think you know the success of the new uh, the Finnish nuclear reactor. Uh, in Europe, it's not a great success story. The cost of heat plant are known. 
it's quite higher than the cost of wind in the UK. Everybody agrees on that. So um, let's see then in the end who wins on the base of economics. Did I see Please identify, tell us who you are. I thought that was a controversial point indeed. I mean, I think what subsidi subsidies really did work, uh, in fact, for, in, in terms of bringing the cost of renewables down. There has recently been a, um, uh, an auction for uh, wind uh, offshore in Germany, and actually uh, the projects got no subsidies at all. And why? Because this project stands on the shoulder of previous projects, and the cost have been able to come down because of subsidies. But if we think of the bigger picture and we see that for, for instance Germany with heavy investment to renewables has not been able to reduce its uh, emissions uh, in energy production. That is, the, that is the, the inconvenient truth behind it. So we, we should not create system that observed individually, yes, the energy price is low there, but it, it should be observed in the, in the bigger context with, with its intermittency problems, then it's not that uh, good performance. Uh, the problem of uh, wind and solar is exactly the intermittency, and those costs of intermission, it, intermittency should be taken into account when, when um, when estimating its its use. There is a good example wind energy in Germany. Since 90, 2000, the cost of wind energy, the, 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 the fed in uh, guaranteed price was nine cents, eight to nine cents. No reduction in the cost. In spite of the fact that in principle the technical progress and the learning effect should reduce the cost of, of wind energy. Why now this, uh, this zero uh, cost and also in the, this is offshore zero and onshore was five cents, half only of the support, in very short time, in only two years or one year, from nine to five. This is not technical progress, this is wrong market design. The wrong market design uh, is very simple. If you are one of these half dozen wind turbine generators and somebody comes and I want to buy a wind turbine from you, what you will do? You know everything. You know what this uh, customer will get from the government. You know how much wind is on that location because you have sold in the area already some of the wind. So you can exactly calculate what is the revenue of this wind plant. And then you calculate maybe 5% return on investment and the rest of the money is yours. You will not reduce the cost. You will only take the political rent of the subsidized system. And the German system was wrong in terms, they did not strongly enough reduce the cost because all the, the, uh, uh, the generators say, we cannot reduce the cost for what's the reason so other. We have seen now in, in the last, there had been three uh, auctions now. That means there is no guaranteed uh, uh, fat in price anymore. The fat in price is determined by an auction, by a competitive process. And simply by shifting from, from the uh, traditional fat in system to a competitive auction has reduced the cost of wind energy by 50%. That is enormous. And I think this is a sign that, that as you mentioned, the old support, the old market design was not really very efficient in terms of showing what is the learning rate, what is the progress rate, etc. Eric, I'm going, to, I'm going to continue the controversy. By, I'm going to agree with you in part, but disagree with you in part. I, mean, I think you're making an important point that, that the cost of the technology is different than the price in the marketplace, right? And often those two are confused in the discussion. And it sounds, I'm not as familiar with the German example, but it sounds from what you're saying like the price has come down dramatically and that's the product of the market design, the shift from the feed-in tariff to the, um, to the auction. But, but I believe the cost of the technology has also come down pretty dramatically. The, the, the cost, with, irrespective of the market design, I, I know that's true for offshore wind. I mean, uh, I remember five or 
six, six years ago looking at offshore wind when I was working at the U.S. Department of Energy, and the projections were that it was always going to be expensive because of corrosivity and because it's hard to repair out in a marine environment. But now we're seeing offshore wind that doesn't cost very much. Whatever the price charge in the marketplace is, with new materials and other innovation, the cost has come down a lot. So I, do you agree with that? It's, I, I think the, the cost of wind power has come down. Yes, indeed, and the cost had been come down since five or ten years already. Un unfortunately, the ratepayers don't benefit from this cost reduction. This is only the producer of the wind turbine which benefits in form of extra profits. And now uh, the system works in Germany in the following. Now the next 20 years, the wind energy turbine which is produced today and which is put on market next year will receive for 20 years the, the 9 cents fed in tariff. So we have still to pay, to wait 20 years until the, the, the profit, the benefit of learning is, 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 is shown to the general public. And this is of course not a very clever market design. It is not a sign of a success, it is to my view a sign of a non-success. That means the chances of the innovation to put the cost down, to make it profitable, now it is visible that this was a technical progress, but it was not visible to the rate payer. And now, yeah, so the, the, that is a big problem. What we are doing, we are, German customers pay 25 billion every year only for the subsidies, which are before. And, and now there is, there is collision negotiation. What we will do with these 25 billion, this will even increase a little bit still, because the effect of this uh, auction will start only in, in two or three years. So. Yeah. This, this is a fantastic discussion. The most important job of a moderator is to close on time, <laughs> particularly in a room where you get kicked out. So, um, so both Tony and Ayurveda have asked uh, to make comments. Well, if each of you could just limit your comment to 60 seconds, and, and then we will have to call this to a close. Yeah, I just want to mention the social dimension in, in this uh, uh, system where uh, renewables are subsidized. It, it practically it means very often uh, transfer in income from poor people to rich people because the rich people are the ones who can uh, invest in uh, in windmill or or solar panel and the, the poor people in the in the small block of flats they just have to pay the the electricity bill and the customer price are, are high in in Germany. Uh, just a final comment from me outside the German market. I suppose back to the theme of the talk, which was innovation and how do you drive it. Uh, just, when I was in that wind industry 15 years, years ago, and we weren't making any, any money by building wind farms. So there was no rent taking at that time. It was simply a way to get at scale efficiencies and supply chain. And, and we need that innovation because without that, you are competing against cross subsidised fossil fuels, uh, are still getting subsidies in a lot of countries. So to say that we don't need subsidies or any form of help is, is being too simplistic on one market design that may have run too long. I don't know enough about it, but I've been on the forefront of bringing these technologies to scale for a long time and, and we need some level of smart design, but we need some level of support for the innovation because we are not competing on an equal playing field. This has been a terrific discussion uh, on some of the most important topics facing the world with some of the world's leading experts. Um, if you thought this was good, come to J Tokyo for the next ISO. Uh, thank you very much.